Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel, and for so many likes. The first story, denied vacation time, forced to find shift replacements or be fired. I blocked calls during a family trip, later learned corporate downsized workforce. The second story, evicted tenant lied, invoked old lease. I used the terms of her old lease to get a payout of about $16,000. The third story, given vague conference topic, I chose to address alternative research, exposing conflict of interest. Organizers withdrew my presentation. The first story is, find a replacement or you're fired. Well, okay, I'll do just that. My first job when I was just turning 17 was fast food. The rules for requesting time off there were a major pain in the A. Schedules started on Thursday and ended on Wednesday. So the manager in charge of scheduling creates and posts the schedule on Monday so there's a few days between you getting your schedule and when you have to work. The problem is if you want time off it has to be requested two weeks before they make the schedule. So if you want to take time off on the weekend you have to ask off almost a month in advance. And since everything is done online, if you miss that time frame by even a day, the program they use won't let you put in the request. And asking in person when you have your next shift results in an I don't know, I'll try to get you those days off but I really need two weeks notice. Standard reply. Keep in mind this policy is in place at a fast food restaurant where 90% of the employees are high schoolers that often have things that come up where they don't have near that much notice. Usually you could get other people to cover your shift if you were gone for some reason. But I had finally had enough when I asked in person, longer requests needed to be in person, to get two weeks off during winter break to go on a trip to Florida with my family, and they only gave me the second week off because there wasn't enough advance notice. When I asked them at the beginning of November, and the trip was at the very end of December and covered New Year's Eve, their policy is that if you have two times or you don't show up or call in to tell them you won't show up, you're fired. So after getting a call from them when first day off came around, and I was halfway across the country, they said I needed to call other workers and find someone to cover for me or I would be fired. I'd had enough so I just blocked the number of the location I worked at, had a peaceful rest of my vacation relying on the mentality of out of sight out of mind. After I got back and tried to check my schedule, my account had already been removed from the system. Most of the people who were good workers and would help you out if you needed them to take your shift had left, so I was looking to get a new job soon anyway. Later I learned they were being extra harsh around then due to corporate wanting to cut down on the overhead, and the best way to do that was to not employ as many workers. The cherry on top is that after I left a friend that still worked there said that a couple of weeks after the general manager fired me, some of the assistant managers were saying that they missed me, and how they now had to spend more time making sure jobs were getting done. The second story is, your lease is still valid, even though you were evicted? Okay. I'm the landlord of some apartments in the city. I sign the lease agreements and go over the basics with tenants, although they don't usually want me to spend hours delving into the fine print. 99% of the time, it's a breeze, and everything is fine. One lady, let's call her Karen, had been paying her rent via a new bank account and new checks for the last several months. All of a sudden, we got several chargeback fees on our account. She had put a stop payment on the checks and closed the account. I immediately called her. Me. Hey Karen, it looks like your checks bounced for the last few months. I just wanted to make sure everything is okay. Karen. Oh no, I promise I'll get this fixed. Me. Okay, you've been a good tenant in the past, so I'll give you a month. Needless to say, a month passed and she didn't pay. So I called her again. Me. Hey Karen, we still haven't received payment, so I'm afraid we'll have to file for eviction. Karen. Oh god no, I'm an old woman. I can't afford to be evicted. I'm trying so hard to pay. Can you give me another shot? Me. As long as you pay before the court date, the eviction doesn't have to go through. The court date arrives and guess who hasn't paid yet? At court, the judge rules for a 24-hour notice to vacate. Karen in tears comes up to me afterwards. Karen, can you please give me another chance? I can't afford to go anywhere else. Me, I'm sorry Karen, but the only way I could do that is if you paid off the debt, signed a new lease agreement, plus a first month's rent, plus a new security deposit. And I don't think that's gonna happen. Goodbye. So I left and I thought that was that. My maintenance guy would come in in a few days to do the inspection and clean up, and then we'd put it on the market. He shows up a few days later and there's a problem. They're still there. So I call the sheriff to schedule a set out. A problem though. According to the sheriff, the 24-hour notice was no longer valid, as we had struck up a deal afterwards, so the court had reversed the eviction decision. I had no recollection of having decided that this would happen. 
I called the court, and they informed me that the eviction was no longer valid, as apparently I told the sheriff that I was giving her more time, invalidating the decision, etc. What happened was that Karen had called the sheriff and told him that the court had reversed the decision because of a non-existent deal. She had then called the court and told them that the sheriff could not evict her, as I had waived the notice, and she had used my words, twisting my denial of an extension into a deal. I tried to give her the benefit of the doubt. I sent Karen a copy of a new lease agreement, asking for the debts, in addition to rent for a first month, and a new security deposit. Her lawyer then contacted me, yes, she had the money to hire a lawyer somehow, informing me that in fact her old lease agreement was still valid, as my deal, you know the one that would require a new lease agreement, invalidated the eviction decision. So I filed for eviction, on the grounds that she had not paid for several months now, five to be exact, and therefore it invalidated her old lease agreement. And then I read her old lease agreement. I already know these contracts pretty well, but like I said, I don't usually delve into the minutia. This time, I did. We show up at court. Karen has her lawyer. Karen is bursting, grinning like a fool, like she's won the lottery. Her lawyer looks fairly happy as well. The judge asks me to speak. Me. I would like Karen to leave the apartments, but she's refusing, despite the fact that according to the court's last decision, she should have left over a month ago now. Judge. And Miss Karen? Lawyer. Miss Karen cannot be ejected from her home without a new notice. Yes, she's not yet paid past due rent. However, she and the landlord struck up a deal, giving her the time she needed to pay via verbal agreement. This deal, made directly after the last court date, invalidated the last decision, so Miss Karen will require a new decision, and therefore a new notice, before she can rightfully be evicted from her home. Until then, her lease agreement is still valid. Insert legal crap. Judge. And landlord, what do you have to say? Me. Well, your honor, I have to agree. They've made a very, very compelling argument. Karen and I did indeed make a deal, giving her the time she needed to pay. And yes, her old lease agreement is still valid, I guess. Well, according to the terms of the still valid lease, there are some additional things that the court needs to be aware of that I'd like to go over for clarification. I'm sure you have a copy, your honor? Judge. Yes, I do. Me. And you have a copy, lawyer? Lawyer. Yes, I do. Me. Excellent. Well, your honor, if you look at section 4, subsection A on page 2, you'll see that after 10 days of non-payment, a late fee of 100% is applied. If you continue reading to subsection B, you'll see that after 15 days of non-payment, additional late fees of $10 per day are applied until full payment is rendered. If you continue to subsection C, you'll see that failed payments necessitate a chargeback fee of $50 per failed payment. If you will continue, your honor, to page 4, section 7, subsection F, you'll see that if a tenant is in any way responsible for a loss of rent, including leaving an apartment in less than move-in ready condition, failed payments, or lastly refusal to vacate in the case of an eviction, the tenant is responsible for payment of said loss of rent, in addition to any other debts owed. In addition, on page 8 section 14 subsection A, you'll note that the tenant is responsible for any and all legal fees resultant from the eviction process, including attorney's fees, such as for the attorney I hired to help me review this lease agreement. Finally, on page 10, the last page, section 17, subsection B, you'll see that the tenant is responsible for all HVAC services rendered on their unit. As we sent in a company to fix the unit in Karen's apartment at her request, we have the invoice here for the replacement unit, in addition to the totals for all the fees listed. At this point, the lawyer has gone completely pale. It's clear that he was more concerned that I would fight the whole deal thing than the terms of the lease he thought he'd have to fight to keep valid. Karen looks utterly shell-shocked, her mouth slightly agape, like a child confused by a game of peekaboo. The judge, meanwhile, is completely unfazed, until I hand her the invoice, alongside my maths, a spreadsheet, and a piece of paper with the total debt owed circled and highlighted at the bottom of the page. Her eyes widened to the size of her mouth, as her jaw dropped with an audible gasp. Me. As you can see, Your Honor, the total owed is in excess of $16,000. I will happily accept the payment in the form of a cashier's check. I'd hate to have to charge yet another $50 fee for failed payment, should another personal check bounce. Judge. Lawyer, do you have anything to say? At this point, the lawyer looks like he's about to pass out. Karen seems to have stopped breathing. The judge remains silent for a moment and then collects herself. Judge. I'm afraid you'll have to address that matter of debt in a different court than this one, landlord. We are here only to judge whether Miss Karen is to be evicted from her home today. Me. Oh, if she wants to stay, I'd be happy to let her as long as she agrees to continue to abide by the terms of the lease agreement, specifically those clauses outlined above, and pays the debt owed today. Judge. 
I'm going to rule for a 24-hour nose to vacate, unless Miss Karen can produce a payment at this moment. Karen sits, still, quiet, speechless even. Her lawyer is eyeing the window. I like to think contemplating his decisions in life that led him to this point. Maybe thinking about jumping, I don't know. Judge. Right. A 24-hour notice to vacate. And landlord? Me. Yes? Judge. You want to file those charges in small claims court. Or a higher court, if it exceeds the amount that you can legally pursue in small claims. Me. Already filed, your honor. The case has now been resolved, and needless to say, I got a fairly significant bonus, in addition to a slight raise. The third story is, I have to choose my own topic to speak about a conference I don't really want to go to? No problem. When I was still fairly new to the job, I was asked to speak at a conference. This conference was actually a promotional event being organized by a manufacturer of a chemical used in my industry. I was employed by a government department to be an independent advisor not beholden to any particular manufacturer or supplier. I felt that speaking at this event was a major conflict of interest, as it would appear that I was openly promoting this particular chemical. However, senior people in my organization were not so ethical. The department was a boys club, and the manufacturer of the chemical was one of these boys, and told me I had to accept the invitation. Even worse, the initial agenda looked like this. John, Topic A. Tom, Topic B. Harry, Topic C. Someone from X Department, Topic TBA. The role of someone from X Department fell to me by default because the other, more preferred candidates were unavailable. I didn't even have an actual place or role on the agenda. I was just an extra to fill a gap. I asked the conference organizer what they wanted me to speak about. How about Topic A, they said. I told them that was being covered by John already. A similar discussion was had about topics B and C, and eventually the conference organizer said, well, why don't you call the other speakers, see what they're talking about, and see where you can fit in. Hang on a minute. It's not my role to do all my own legwork to find a topic. That's your role as an organizer. My role as a speaker is to take the topic you give me, do my research, write my talk, and deliver it. And quite frankly, if the organizers couldn't think of a topic, did I really need to be a presenter at all? I thought fine. If you want me to choose my own topic, then I'm going to present another point of view. There had been some recent research into other chemicals and the results were promising, so I thought I'd talk about this research. And to be quite honest, I simply couldn't think of another topic as I felt every base had been covered by people much more experienced than me. So I informed the conference organizers that I'd chosen my topic, and I would speak about the recent work on these other products. I then got hold of the results of the research and wrote what I think was a pretty good speech. Well, a few days later, the conference organizer rang me and said they didn't need me after all. No apology for wasting my time was given. Edit. Yes, that's a fair comment for a conference generally. I use the word conference because if I use the term normally used in my industry for such a gathering, it might identify my industry. And for this type of gathering, the organizers normally set the agenda and get the speakers to cover a particular topic. They do not go sort it out for yourself. Edit 2. I didn't think much about being coerced into something I felt was a major conflict of interest in the first place. And then it was clear I was superfluous because even the organizers couldn't suggest a topic, and it was up to me to come up with one. And then when I did come up with a topic, then all of a sudden they didn't want me after all. Ugh. Hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. See you in the next video.